you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. For 13 and a half years, it'll be 14 in August, we've been doing this show. And uh, we have nothing better to do, clearly, with our time. And we have some of the most greatest minds that come on the show. None of them are me. <laughs> so, as always, we'll be talking about uh, an amazing author and her latest book that comes out March 21st, 2023. But before that, we have to shame you with the plugs. Of course, uh, refer the show to your family and relatives. Uh, tell them to go to youtube.com, for chess Chris Foss, goodreads.com, for chess Chris Foss, uh, the big LinkedIn group, LinkedIn newsletter, follow that silliness over there and everything else she is the author of the amazing new book as i aforementioned uh out this month or actually march 21st 2023 <laughs> i'm still in march i'm i'm just dragging this year man i'm just i'm just not accepting it i'm about two months behind i think of this pace uh the newest book came out march 21st 2023 benjamin banneker and us 11 generations of an american family by Rachel Jameson Webster. She's on the show joining us today to talk about her amazing insight and research in this book. It took her years to compile and is an integral part of the history of America. America, <laughs> an integral part of America, as they say, uh, if you're not throwing away Bud Light these days. I don't know. There's a joke. There's somewhere people move on. Uh, Rachel Webster is a professor of creative writing at Northwestern University and the author of four books of poetry and cross-gender genre genre <laughs> cross genre writing she has taught writing workshops through the uh, national urban league chicago public schools gallery 37 and the pacific northwest college of art she's got more college than i clearly have because i can't even pronounce, pronounce genre uh she's been working to bring diversity and anti-racist awareness into creative writing curricula uh rachel's essays poems and stories have been published in outlets including poetry tin house and the yale review uh she uh this is her first non-fiction book and she lives in evanston illinois with her husband and daughter welcome to the show rachel how are you Thank you. Great. Great to see you, Chris. How are you? Well, you're the only person who ever says that because uh, most people aren't uh, great to see me or happy to see me. But that's another story. <laughs> I don't know. There's a joke somewhere. Um, so uh, give us your dot coms wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs and get to know you better. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Rachel Jamison Webster dot com. That's my website. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram under my name. There you go. So congratulations on the new book. These Thank are always you. fun. Uh, what motivated you want to write this book? Well, I, it is a story of about America, as you said. And I grew up in a little town in Ohio. So in kind of a small rural town and didn't really think I would ever write about where I was from. I grew up definitely thinking about myself as an American. My family thought of ourselves. We identified as Americans proudly. And um, then, you know, as the political divisiveness sort of erupted around 2015, 2016, I started thinking that I would like to start um, analyzing and reflecting on the place I grew up. Right around that time, I was at my cousin's wedding talking to another cousin who mentioned something about our mixed race ancestry and our long, our many generations of African American ancestry. Wow. And, right. So that came out of the blue. Um, I didn't know anything about this. And my parents, we had just recently gotten my father a um, ancestry.com package for Christmas. So I asked to see his results. And of course, um, Ireland, Northern Ireland were, or, or Northern Europe was colored in. And so was Senegal mm -hmm. and Gambia. So there it was. There were a couple different avenues of information pointing me to the fact that although my family, we had always thought of ourselves as very American, we had 
passed as white, we had denied the part of the ancestry that was African American. Wow. So I thought, yeah, <laughs> right. So I thought that was interesting and something to explore. So give us like a 30,000 foot view of the book. Uh, what, do, what do you uh, kind of find and, and uh, what readers are going to see inside of it? Great, thanks. So basically the stories go all the way back to the late 1600s. And one of the ancestors that we descend from was the sister of Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker was this amazing figure. I didn't learn about him in school. So that was another moment of humility and realizing how much I hadn't been taught about American history. But here he was this black scientist. He was a free person of color born in 1731, and he ended up becoming a self-taught scientist. He was an astronomer. He published best-selling almanacs in the revolutionary era, and he helped survey Washington, D.C. So because he became famous in his lifetime, people took the time to record his family stories and mm. his ancestry, which means we could go all the way back to the late 1600s to his grandmother, Molly, who was an indentured servant from England, a working class, poor working class woman from England. And she had children with Banaka, who was kidnapped into slavery from Senegal. Hmm. So I tell the stories of the ancestors. Each, each historical chapter is a story of the ancestors or one of them or one generation. And then the present day chapters are conversations between me and my cousins. So I had, uh, this is another part of the story, but I had a long pause before I knew how to write this as a book because I felt that it was very ethically complicated mm -hmm. and problematic and maybe not even possible to write this book well as a white person who had not grown up in black culture. Mm -hmm. And luckily as I was in that debate, my cousin Edie got in touch with me and said, we need to talk about our family. And so my conversations with my black cousins who are also descendants of the same family, those are every other chapter. So it's sort of a chapter in the past, then a chapter in the present. Wow. And everyone gets to contribute and, and talk about the experience of, of, of being black and, and, and going through the generations of family? Yes, exactly. Wow. So we this should, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, this is uh, a reading from the PR thing in 19, 1791, 1991, in 1791, Thomas Jefferson hired a black man to help survey Washington, D.C., and that was Benjamin Banneker. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gentleman was a mathematician, writer of almanacs, one of the greatest astronomer, astronomers of his generation. Mm -hmm. This guy's brilliant. Like, he does, like... He does like everything. I'm reading the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page. I can't even say Wikipedia. This guy's an astronomer. <laughs> uh, he's writing almanacs. He's a surveyor. He's a farmer. He's like he's like the Renaissance man, jack of all trades. Exactly. And um, him mapping out, I guess, uh, Washington D.C. and and doing all this stuff was integral to uh, our whole history. I guess. Exactly. So he helped to survey the Capitol. Mm -hmm. He was the assistant to Major Ellicott, who was a good family friend. The Ellicotts were Quakers. And so they were able to see past his skin color and see his brilliance. And he was very good friends with this family who kind of marveled at his intelligence and his brilliance. He was well known in his area of Maryland, but that's how he was able to be hired and sent to Washington, D.C. to help survey the Capitol. Wow. And this this uh, works out pretty good for him. And it's a great thing. You know, is this one of these stories uh, we've had a number of authors on in recent years that, you know, they found that certain stories, whitewashing might be the, right, the proper word for it, where the, the black people and some of their achievements and stuff were left out of history books. Yes. And uh, it seems pretty prevalent. This was kind of a thing going on for the past couple, 200 years. And thankfully now some of these stories and, and some of that is being righted, I suppose, as best it can possibly be, given um, you know these people aren't alive anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I think it's, there's an importance to that, right? Where we start shining a light on Black history and 
Um, you know, because their story is integral to our story. It is all of our story. It's all of our story. Exactly. And to not see it as a separate history, but to see it as American history. Exactly. That's important. And I do think it's very exciting to see how many of these stories are being brought up into consciousness now. And um, Benjamin Banneker, it's extraordinary. His, his journal, his manuscript journal is in the public domain. You can go to the Maryland Historical Society and see his notes, wow. his astronomical notes, the poems he wrote, he recorded his dreams. Um, and then you can also see his almanac. So he was well known in his time. And I, as I said before, I didn't learn about him in school. Uh, many black people that I talk to are more aware of Benjamin Banneker, but he's often given a sentence in the history books mm -hmm. or a very quick mention. And, um, and yet there is more documentation of his life than people even realize. Um, so it's been exciting. I felt like that was that was a central aim of this book is to share his story and sort of give him his rightful place with the founding fathers, um, partly because it's a self-actualized story. He was yeah. self-taught. And he not only was hired by Benj or he was hired by Thomas Jefferson to help survey the Capitol, he then corresponded with Jefferson and called Jefferson out on his hypocrisy as an enslaver oh. who wrote about freedom, mm -hmm. which is sort of where we are as a country, where we're wanting to root out these foundational hypocrisies. He was doing that at the time. So he's a really good guide <laughs> in speaking truth. <laughs> He was ahead of his time by a few hundred years. So there yeah, you go. Good for was. him. But he probably made maybe Jefferson consider some of the issues and problems or way in his mind a little bit better. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Jefferson did write back right away. He wrote mm -hmm. a very respectful letter in return. And he promised to send Benjamin Banneker's almanac because Benjamin had sent him a copy of his almanac. And Benjamin or er, and Jefferson promised to send it to the head of the Academy of Sciences in France, which was the foremost intellectual institution of its day. So Jefferson did want it to be recognized as evidence of what was possible for African people. And there that you go. Rare. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is a tough uh, era to become self-educated too. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, he didn't have, I don't know if he had access to libraries or how was he able to get uh, access to any sort of training or knowledge or you just figure it out on his own? I think he spent a lot of time observing nature. I know he did. Mm -hmm. He also was able to go to two years of Quaker school mm -hmm. and there was a school in the area that didn't discriminate in terms of color. So he was able mm -hmm. to attend and his um, schoolmaster was so impressed with him that he would lend him books. Mm -hmm. And then I believe he also purchased books on his own because there are accounts of his library in his cabin. So um, I think he was probably doing anything in his power to borrow books and to read books and to teach himself. There you go. Now, you, the, the title mentions 11 generations of an American family. How does the 11 generations play into the book? Well, it it's sort of, I would be the 11th generation. So mm -hmm. all of us alive now are grappling with where the country is in this moment and looking at what we're going through now. And then it goes all the way back to the generations that I mentioned, Benjamin and his sisters, but also his parents and his grandparents who were brought here when this was just a conglomerate of colonies. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even a country yet. So I thought it was really interesting to think about what they were witnessing mm -hmm. as the idea of America was taking shape and mm -hmm. what we're witnessing now as we're sort of in a revision period for what mm -hmm. this even means. Um, and then because we have these great human stories, it also became a way to think about racism and to look at how racism and the racial constructions were, were written into law. And we're still living with those outcomes. Yeah. Jim Crow and other things. You know, it's, I think it's an important time and it's an important time to have books like yours and mm -hmm. education uh, to tell these stories, to bring them to light um, so that we can understand that, you know, I, I grew up uh, with that, with that uh, whitewash uh, sort of experience in school. A lot of stuff we weren't taught. 
Mm -hmm. and and of course i really wasn't into history i funked it a number of times but i learned some stuff in there in spite of it but you know we you know we we grew up with this whole image of the uh, john wayne and mm -hmm. and uh, oh i conquerors conquered everybody because everyone was bad and you know that whole narrative that kind of was the mm -hmm. theme through a lot of his movies and i think i think he suffered from a bit of racism himself if i remember correctly um but uh you know being in a time now where we're trying to reconcile that history we're trying to tear down some of the ugliness that we've had you know the things that statues are put up under jim crow uh you know a lot of people are tossing about do we do we do we uh keep up uh, statues of our founding fathers because they were involved in racism and everything else but i think it's a healthy discussion to have mm -hmm. i do you know too more? and i think it has to become more and more complex you have to look at People were a product of their time, but there are also things that we were made to think of as natural that were not. They were completely constructed. So just to stay with Benjamin Banneker's story, you know, throughout history, he's had people who have doubted his abilities or doubted him. And yet we have things on paper that he wrote. We have books that he published, but his cabin was burnt down on the day of his funeral. So, that seems a bit suspect. Exactly. And familiar. So mm. there is this, the whitewashing includes a violence to it that will eradicate people's, people of color's intelligence, their contributions. And so then there isn't as much of a paper trail, right? And mm. so there, it, it's a very um, complex situation and it's been going on since before the country was even a country yeah i remember we had one uh uh who's uh madison's uh president madison's wife dolly? Was, it molly? was it molly dolly i think dolly dolly uh i believe after wasn't it after uh he died or when they both died she had everything burned like all the notes all the records oh, and stuff if know. i remember correctly Wow. We had an author on that talked about that. And so there was a there was a bit of this stuff, like you mentioned, going on of trying to erase history and whitewash history. And I guess one of the problems was uh, she may or may not have, and this author said that uh, it, it had, that she, they were trying to hide the fact that they'd had a mixed family, that Jason Madison, uh, our fourth U.S. president, for those of you who are millennials uh, or Gen Zers, uh, <laughs> uh, I kid the Gen Zers, um, the, uh, but go back to school. Uh, the, uh, you know, that she was trying to whitewash the, the history where they had mixed family. And I guess there's some DNA that proves otherwise, um, that they got into, but yeah, there was a lot of this going on, very hateful, very ugly, very dark part of our history. But I think it's important that we shine a light on it and go, Hey man, let's, let's come to reconciliation with, um, you know, the contribution of, of, uh, African Americans and what they did to our country, everybody else, you know, we need to recognize, um, uh, everybody else. I mean, we, we did, we did some ugly stuff in this country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we were still doing it in the 1950s when we, you know, set up internment camps for, yeah. um, the Japanese, uh, you know, we, and we're still kind of struggling with it. I mean, you see how we're struggling with it in, you know, George Floyd and other things. I mean, recently, there was a, a young black gentleman who was shot just for knocking on the wrong door. Thankfully, they're looks like they're prosecuting that. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think these these uh, discussions are really important because they shine a light on these, and we need to sit down and have these conversations. I think. Thank you. I do too. A central method in the book is conversation. Mm -hmm. It's me having conversations with my cousins, and I really believe in that. I believe in showing that. And understanding that these conversations won't be easy, they won't be perfect, we'll all make mistakes, and yet it's so important. And I, I'm so glad you took the conversation to the Dolly Madison story, because I do think that one of our central denials in this country is how related we are. Mm -hmm. We are very interrelated. And that was, you know, the central discovery of this book is that just like my family left out our black history and our family history, the country left that out in their origin story. And then I had this incredible opportunity to get to know my cousins and have a fuller, truer history. And for us to acknowledge each other as relatives and 
there is a lot of that to be done. There were a lot of mixed race families and um, old families in this country do have do have cousins across mm -hmm. the color line. And um, the difficulty is that story is very painful because it was almost always white enslavers, male enslavers having unconsensual sex with their their own enslaved women. And so there's a lot of pain. And yet I think to be able to acknowledge that pain and acknowledge that reality is, is just central to figuring out how we go forward. There you go. I mean, in our constitution, it says we, the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, perfection is never achieved. So we're, you know, for what, 200 and almost 50 years, we've been on a journey to try and find a perfect form of democracy, the Republic and, who we are as a nation, our identity, and uh, we'll probably always be on that journey. But the yeah. you know the better we can come, the more we can work, the more, like you mentioned, we can converse. Um, do you have any stories or or uh, things you want to share? Out maybe something you surprised you in the research in 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 some of your relatives and their contributions to the story. Thanks for asking. Yeah, there were so many moments that felt like beyond synchronistic or beyond what we could have planned. So we started to get in a flow of working on this book together and we would be, um, we'd be thinking about something and one of the others would be as well. And we'd call and we'd just sort of be on the same page. But um, one of the, the most powerful moments like that is I was supposed to talk to Robert, who's one of the main contributors to the book. And again, they all shared their own stories, but they shared their research as well about the mm. family, which is why I was able to do, you know, many years of research in a few years. In any case, Robert and I were supposed to talk on January 6th, and I was working on the chapter about Benjamin Banneker surveying the Capitol. So I was doing all this research about the Capitol, you know, about Pennsylvania Avenue, followed the, the line of the Star of Sirius, which was Banneker's favorite star. So I'm doing all this writing. And right at the time Robert and I were supposed to talk, all of a sudden I hear from the other room, my daughter's on Zoom with her social studies class. And the teacher says, put on the TV. This is history happening right now. And it's the insurrection of the Capitol. Oh, wow. So here we are. I have been writing for two days about the design of the Capitol and about these men standing there visualizing a Capitol devoted to freedom. And in real time, we are watching this you know, other people who believe that they're protecting freedom, I don't agree with that, storming the very Capitol. And um, I was able to be on the phone with Robert, who is a black man in his 70s, my cousin, and we were processing what this would look like if those were Black Lives Matter protesters. Yeah. And how different. And so there were so many moments where I would be thinking that I was writing history, but it would sort of whoo, rear up into the present moment and it would feel like, I'm seeing this repetition, this repetition of racialized violence or um, the same symbols being trotted out, the same anxieties being on display. Um, so there were moments, that's kind of a dark story. Um, but it's true, it's, it's something we have to face. Yeah, there were moments too, they felt like confirmation, like, mm -hmm. okay, we're supposed to be working on this book right now. And if any healing is possible or any sort of awareness, we're going to come to it together by having these conversations. Yeah, it's it's something that we have to, it, it, because we've never sat down and reconciled it, I would say, is, is the reason we're reliving it. You know, one yeah. of the most, we've had a lot of authors on who wrote about the day. In fact, we had the Capitol Police officer that day on uh, for his book. And um when I saw, I mean, I was horrified. I was in high anxiety. I mean, my heart was, I finally had to just go lay down because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, I was so just enraged internally. Um, and uh, so but when I saw the, the, the Confederate flag in the Capitol, which had never gotten that far in the first 
civil war if you it's interesting i reference it that way but um to see that flag in the capitol just was a glaring just a blow just 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 a shock that jesus we've never reconciled this whole thing these people are still on the losing side of that thing trying to make it work and to me, that was the, that was probably the most significant sign. I don't know. There's so many different things that went on that day, but to me, that was like this has not been reconciled. We have not dealt with this. We have not faced this. We have not faced the ugliness of of the thing. And and we still have people that think it's really cool to be on the traitor side of what really was a traitorous uh, attack on America when it came down exactly. to it. And they lost. And I and somehow we built a lot of statues. I mean, it was part of Jim Crow and and uh, and some people that were trying to intimidate black people and keep the uh, dream alive of the Confederacy and and all that crap. Um, you know, they they built these statues everywhere and turned these guys into celebs. And we kind of slept through it a little bit, but turns out we knew that they knew what their wink and nod was about. I didn't even realize it until I, you know, I'm like, what's going on? Wait, no, wait, where did this come from? And, you know, but it was an important thing because I think they made it shine a light on more of us that, hey, this isn't reconciled. And that's why stories and books like you, are, I think, are important. The only thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. And thereby he goes round and round. So until we sit down and reconcile the stuff and deal with it, um, you know, hopefully we can keep from having some sort of another crazy insurrection or some guy who almost takes democracy away from us. I agree. I heard yeah. you say the first civil war. Yeah, that like, kind of slipped, but maybe it's appropriate. I don't know. It was kind of a mini civil war, really, when it came down to it, the second one. Yes, and I'm not sure we're through it, honestly. I think that we still have people, militias, and people who are nursing this insecurity and hatred and violence. And so mm -hmm. we are living in really interesting and really difficult times. Um, but I, I saw that the same way. It felt like just the ugly subconscious sort of boiling up in the country. So um, I hope, I hope. Uh, the, at the same time, you know, I've been getting so many notes since this book came out just about three weeks ago from mm -hmm. people who have similarly multiracial ancestry. Mm -hmm. And they're thanking me because they haven't known how to talk about it or how to reach out. So that gives me some hope that there is a desire to bridge some gaps and to increase humility and understanding among um, European Americans or what we would think of as white Americans to really open a space for this deeper understanding. There you go. You know, it, and 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 hopefully stories like this make us realize, hey, we are we are one people. We're mm -hmm. American. I don't want to take away exactly. people's identities and cultures and ideologies and stuff that they've been raised with. But we, we do all need to come to the conclusion that, hey, we're all Americans. Mm -hmm. We all need to get along in the mm -hmm. famous words of uh, that one gentleman. Uh, mm -hmm. Why can't we all get along? <laughs> and, and and so stories like this realize that our, our past, our history, our future is integral to getting along and working together and realizing that we are you know really uh, an american family as the book title mm -hmm. your book says mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a small uh, it's a small tide pool of of the bigger ocean of what america really is and what got us here and you know and facing your demons is the best way to resolve them so that's Definitely. kind of the area that we're in right now yeah exactly Mm -hmm. There's a lot of white fear. There's um, and and it it needs to be faced. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I've seen I've seen Republican little old ladies say uh, we treated them black people horribly for 200 years. If they get power, they're going to treat us horribly. Or if you know the Mexicans come and they take over voting, you know, you see this white uh, fragility uh, over some sort of perceived white scarcity that somehow losing power will. You know, it's it's the old scarcity mindset, you know, exactly when really we need to realize, especially with the, the beauty of America and and the foundation of what we're about, that anybody can win or succeed here. Um, it, 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 their dreams can come alive, you know, read off the Statue of Liberty um, and, and that a rising tide lifts all boats. 
And that's mm-hmm. really the story of America when it mm-hmm. comes down to it, or, or it should be. But as always, we're, we're, you know, working to form that perfect union. And it's always going to be the yins and yangs, as uh, President Obama put it, where we're mm-hmm. always going to be trying to zig and zag and find where we need to go. I believe zig and zag was the quote he used. So there you go. Anything more you want to tease out about the book before we go? Um, well, it was just such an honor and a pleasure to tell the stories. And even though it sort of centers on Benjamin Banneker, there are all, a lot of good stories about women in here as well. Mm-hmm. Because part of what, what I wanted to do was upend this individualistic narrative that we get and sort of the, the great man model of history mm-hmm. and really look at the fact that we're all a part of our contexts, our families, our community. And so it was fun to discover these heroic women. So his mother was an herbalist and a healer, a businesswoman, and she actually went to court to argue for the freedom of her children. Wow. And then his, yeah. So, I mean, really brave women. And then his grandmother, Molly, who came from England, she uh, was sentenced to die for spilling a bucket of milk. So her story really illuminates the hardships that were happening to working class people in Europe who were coming here, you know, with nothing. And so she only escaped the death penalty because she knew how to read. So wow. she came here as an indentured servant and then partnered with an African man. So I think we have always had these heroic stories with us. Mm-hmm. We have more than just a story of suffering once we start opening it up. And there were a lot of heroic women in the line, too, that I got to learn from as I wrote the book. Yeah. Well, without that foundation, I mean, he could probably couldn't have pulled off some of the things he did. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, certainly if you've got smart parents, you know, they help you maybe guide you down a pathway to be smarter. My parents were smart. So clearly something wrong (laughs) happened in my training, but (laughs) there's that, but no, this is great. And it's a beautiful story. I, I didn't even know about this gentleman Mm -hmm. and I learned so much about how, you know, the history of, of Washington DC and, and laying it out. And, uh, certainly he's got more going for, he had more going for him at a young age than I do now. So props to him. <laughs> you to have a him. much bigger audience probably. Well, I mean, you know, but I mean, he didn't have zoom. So, you know, right. that's, that's yeah, the, the almanac was like the iPhone of its day. There so you go. He was I mean, all about the latest technology like you. Yeah. And writing books and stuff like that back then, that was like no mm-hmm. small feat. You know, know. He didn't have Amazon. Uh, what was it that we used for the writing the book? Amazon. He didn't whatever. have Chat yeah. GPT. Didn't have or Chat anything. GPT. Yeah. He now he it. just. I'm gonna the sh- Chat GPT. The AI is gonna take over the show next week, oh and so pe- you're just people are just gonna come on and talk to a bot, which. <laughs> <laughs> which I've had some people tell me is not going to be that much different. Well, it's been wonderful, Rachel, to have you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on with your Thank you. It's uh, been great author. to be here. Thanks there you so go. Much, Chris. Uh, give us a dot com so people can find you on the interwebs to get to know what your story is better. Rachel Jameson Webster dot com. There you go. And folks, order up the book wherever fine books are sold because uh, alleyway bookstores can be dangerous. And you might need to take a shot. I don't know what that means. It just sounded always good. Uh, you can order it wherever fine books are sold. Benjamin Banneker and us, 11 generations of an American family. And you should learn about his history. It's pretty cool. I was going through his Wikipedia. I don't, I don't think he wrote it, but maybe he did. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Wikipedia's been around for a long time. But uh, it's really interesting. And this intertwines with Thomas Jefferson and part of the history of our country. So it's important. The more you know as it were. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, youtube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, all those crazy places on the internet where the kids play. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys.